We are, as you can see, we're uh, continuing in our study of Matthew 24. I plan on finish this chapter tonight, and then we'll you know, we'll move on to some other things in our prophecy study. Verse 32 tonight, um, as we go along here. Last week, you may remember, we looked at uh, some time indicators over the last couple of weeks that Jesus talked about in the... Um, where he said, you know, after the tribulation of those days, you'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds of glory and so forth like that. And we parallel with the uh, common description throughout the Bible of Christ's <clears throat> second coming is like that, with clouds, angels, trumpets, and shouts, and a lot of things. Very visible, very loud, and so forth. So when we uh, looked at some other scriptures that supports what I believe uh, be an accurate uh, timeline of prophetic events is that the, the rapture that Paul talks about comes at the end of the tribulation, not at the beginning. So anyway, we kind of went over that last week. We'll uh, continue on here tonight. And uh, Jesus continues to uh, give them some things to watch for. He says, now <clears throat> learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth, put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Now, this is not a prophetic reference to Israel's reestablishment as a nation in 1948. A lot of people want to try to make it that, but it's just simply not. This is just simply an example of a time indicator that Jesus is, is giving because for them it was an example. It would be like... Uh, you know, I mean, the same thing really could apply to us. And say, well, I saw the... Uh, okay, for us, we've got some maxims like that. For example, in conversation, we'll say, hey, I noticed the mesquite trees putting out today. What does that mean to all of us? We all know that winter's over. <laughs> pecan trees, you see leaves coming on the pecan trees. We could say something like that. Well, it's all, uh, leaves coming on the pecan trees, the boy, winter's over. And that's pretty much, that's, that's all that Jesus meant here. He's not trying to make some prophetic comparison with Israel as the fig tree. And then when they came back in 1948, that meant, you know, there were young leaves on the fig tree. And it's going to be, you know, one generation away from the Lord's second coming. And all, a lot of the prophecy people have tried to make that. But that's, that's, not, that's not what he's saying here. That's not what's going on here. He's just simply using a figure of speech in his example uh, to show them, uh, you know, just like this, guys, when you see the, you know, big tree put out new leaves, you know, summer's getting close. He goes on to say, so likewise, ye, when ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. And remember, all of these things Jesus is telling them is in answer to the questions they asked him at the beginning of the chapter. When they said, you know, they said, wow, look at all the big, magnificent buildings of the temple. And uh, he said, you know, not one stone is going to be left here upon another. It won't be thrown down. And so then they came back and asked him, well, you know, when's that going to happen and what's going to be the sign of your coming? Go <laughs> Now you don't have to put her outside. I'm not. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. <laughs> One way to liven up your Bible study. Bring your dog. Bring your dog. Let him play. Uh, so <clears throat> he's answering their question. As I said, you know, when when are the when what it's going to be the sign of your coming, and when are these things going to happen? We said, well, so likewise, when you see all these things happen, know that it's near my second coming and the the, the end of these things, and the the all things that he's talking about here are the things that he talked about earlier in the chapter, uh, the beginning of you know God's judgments and things like that, uh, the famines and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. False Christ and false prophets showing up. Um, the Antichrist rising and setting himself up in the temple to be worshipped as God and so forth like that. 
And he tell them, look, when you see that, the abomination of desolation, run. Drop what you're doing and run. Run to the mountains to save yourselves. Don't go back and get your clothes. Don't get anything. Just go. Just run. So that's, that's the all things that he's talking about here. When you see all these things that I just told you about happening, then you're going to know that it's my second coming is near. It's, you know, it's right there even at the doors. So that's what he's talking about here and answering their question that they asked him at the beginning. Uh, so he goes on to say, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. This, this verse is one that's been extremely misapplied and misunderstood. And a, a lot of the, you know, prophecy people have taken this and misinterpreted it. Okay, because Jesus said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Coupling that with what he said about, you know, when you see the fig tree, putting on new leaves and so forth, know that it's near, even at the doors. So they've taken this and they've, and, and they've put it together to mean that, okay, the, the fig tree budding out, that means the reestablishment of Israel in 1948. That's what that means. That's what Jesus was talking about. And then when he said that generation would not pass till all those things be fulfilled, then they come back and say, okay, well then that means within one generation from 1948, then that's when the Lord's going to come. That's where uh, the guy, and I can't remember his name, but this guy wrote this book, uh, 88 Reasons Why Christ is Going to Return in 1988. And one of them was 40 years. They, they estimated a generation, they figured about 40 years. Well, 40 years after 1948 to 1988. So they figured, well, that's one reason Christ is going to return because that's about a generation. Well, then it didn't happen. So they had to extend then a generation. So, well, you know, a generation for us is about 70 years. <laughs> so it's been, we're what, 69 years away from, from 1948. So, you know, as time draws out, it doesn't happen. All of the Bible prophecy people that have taken these verses and misinterpreted them and just nailed down these definitions for these things and explanations that, that are, are not what he, what he was talking about, not what Jesus was talking about. Uh, now they're kind of stuck because they're having to revise their stories and change their definitions and all this kind of stuff. So generation, and it is a big debate about, well, what did Jesus mean about a generation? Now, uh, trans, translated from, I believe, Jesus speaking Hebrew, but in the Greek, and this is basically what it means, the uh, generation of the, you know, genea, uh, an age, uh, the, the period, or, you know, the, the persons that, that represent that group, you know, an age or a, a nation or a time. And now, here's the thing that... Uh, gives us the understanding about what Jesus meant and why He said what He did. Now, we don't have to try to change the definition of a generation. We don't have to try to look for some alternate meanings. It means what it means. Jesus meant that group of people that were alive at that time, that were listening to Him, and that we're experiencing those things, those people of Israel that were part in making the decision of whether or not to accept Him as their Messiah, they were the group of people that He was talking about. Now, we can look back from a 2,000 year perspective in history and we can say, well, wait a minute. All those things didn't happen within that generation's lifetime. Now, here's where, you know, like the, the Calvinist, the Preterist, uh, 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 viewpoint comes in. The preterist uh, prophecy viewpoint is that all prophecy, uh, prophecy things were fulfilled around 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was destroyed and all that. Uh, you can you can squeeze a couple of Bible facts in there, but the vast majority of them you can't. So that that theory doesn't wash. So how then do we reconcile if Jesus was talking about? within the lifetime of that generation, these things would happen, but we look back and say, but they didn't happen within the lifetime of that generation. We've got to consider viewpoint. 
And this is one of the one of the things that indicates to us that okay, most of what Jesus knew, he knew from the scriptures. He did, you know, receive revelation from his father too. We know that. We know his father spoke to him. Spoke to him in prayer, spoke to him at different times. Jesus received some special revelation. But uh, uh, there, there were things that Jesus in his humanity didn't know. He made statements at times such as, you know, whatever I hear my father speak, that I speak. And whatever, you know, the father directs me to do, that's what I do. I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do his will and, you know, fulfill his work. And there are other things, and we're going to look at one here in just a second, that indicates that, that when, when Jesus came as a human being, even though he, he maintained the, the divine, sinless nature of his Father, still he put off a lot of his glory. And there were things, and I know there's a lot of people, religious people, that would burn you at the stake for even making a statement like this. But during Jesus' normal human lifetime, there were things that he didn't know. What Jesus knew about God's prophetic plan for Israel was that all of these things were going to happen. Because when, when the things that were happening to him, and by the time he's telling his, his disciples this, talking to him about these things, by this point, Israel has rejected him. The Pharisees are scheming to kill him. Judas has already made the deal to betray him for the 30 pieces of silver by this point. And he knows that the Pharisees are out to kill him. And he knows that a lot of the, the people in Israel, even ones that heard him, even some of them that received John's baptism and so on, have turned away from him and will not acknowledge him as their Messiah. So Jesus knows that he's going to be crucified. He knows he'll you know, uh, rise again because he talked about those things. Uh, but he also knows that because Israel has rejected him as their Messiah, then after his resurrection, that judgment is coming. And the, the next thing that they're expecting to happen, and you see this reflected in Peter's preaching, you know, in those early chapters of Acts, when he's warning people, look, uh, prepare yourselves for judgment. Re repent, because judgment, judgment is coming. Save yourselves from this twisted, you know, generation, and so forth. So from, from Jesus' standpoint, from what he knows and what everybody knows about their prophetic plan and the schedule of prophetic events, judgment is right around the corner. And the, you know, those things are going are to begin to happen, those events of Daniel's 70th week, um, Christ would return and establish his kingdom, and all of the apostles... All the way till the end of their lifetimes, they were expecting it to happen within their life. Paul was. He fully expected Christ's return within his lifetime. John, James, Peter, Jude, all of those guys, they all expected Christ's return within their lifetime because that's what they had been told. And a lot of the reason why, and I may be jumping ahead of myself here, but uh, a lot of the reasons why those apostles stayed in Jerusalem... After Jesus, uh, I think I'm jumping ahead of myself, but anyway, I'll go ahead and make this point, because we'll, we'll come back to it. The reason they stayed there uh, was because they were expecting His return. You know, they were expecting to come back, and they were going to be there, you know, in Jerusalem when He came back. So, the reason Jesus makes this statement was because from His point of view, all those things would be fulfilled. All those prophetic events would be fulfilled within the lifetime of that group of people. Now, the thing about uh, the, the reason why it didn't, and we know this from Paul, because Paul states clearly that the, uh, the mystery of the gospel of Christ, it was revealed to him that he preached and that he taught mainly for the, you know, the Gentile body of Christ, you know, also for Jews as well. He says that was a mystery that God had kept secret from the foundation of the earth and that nobody knew about that. 
Nobody knew about this period of time we're in when God would open up the way of salvation by grace for all people through you know, faith in the gospel of Christ. No, none of them knew about that. Even Jesus didn't know about that. If he had known about it, he would have said something about it. But he didn't, you know, because his ministry, as Paul said, he was the minister to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. That's what he came for. Specifically for them. So he he understood prophecy from their standpoint. And so we don't need to try to twist this around or apply it to really to today or try to come up with some different alternate uh, definition for generation. It means what it means. It means the same thing as we said well, this generation. You know, this, today's the you know uh, iPhone generation and so on like that. In 10 years there will probably be something else. In 10 years there will probably be a brain implant or something. You won't even have to have an iPhone. You can just, you know, think it. It'll <laughs> call people or something like that. Uh, you know, your watch. You just use your watch for your phone. So anyway, that that's why Jesus made that statement. And that's, that's the explanation of that. Now, if you don't understand right division, you're not going to understand that. If you don't understand the two different programs... Where God's dealing with Israel under the covenants and under the law at, at that time. And then after he suspended their program, he's dealing with everybody under his grace. And he could do that because of Christ's finished work on the cross and the power of his resurrection. You know, that opened the way wide open for the powerful working of God's grace, which is in effect now. And God's not dealing with anybody under the covenants and the law now. He's dealing with everybody under grace. Uh, you know, one day that will stop. He'll go and once again uh, begin to deal with Israel under the covenants once all these end time events begin. And uh, it will move forward towards His coming judgment. So, that explains that. Jesus went on to say, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now, there are a number of uh, prophetic scriptures that point to the fact that the heavens we see, the sky, outer space, all the things out there, this earth right here, it will it will come to its end and it will pass away. You know the uh, where was it? I think it's one of the Psalms. I didn't think of it, uh, think of it till now, or I would have added it in here about the earth waxing old as a garment, you know, and you'll know, fold it up and so on like that. Uh, maybe Peter quote. Huh? Peter quotes that or not. The prophets and apostles knew about it, and they also the everlasting nature of God's Word. Psalm 102. It says, of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish. But thou shalt endure, yea, all of them shall wax. There it is. There, I did have it in there. All of them shall wax old like a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. Uh, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. So, uh, you know, the, the present heavens and earth, it's gonna, it's gonna wear out. You know, and I tell you, there's another thing too. If you read through the Psalms, notice how often. It emphasizes God as creator. It's creator of heaven and earth. You know, it, throughout all the Bible, you, all the prophets talk about God as creator. Uh, Isaiah writes about it. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their host shall fall down as a, the leaf falleth off from the vine. As a falling fig from the fig tree. Is your mama being mean to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Isaiah 66. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. A specific promise to Israel. As a matter of fact, this is one of the promises Paul was talking about, referring to Christ, who was the one who came for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. This is one of them right here. Second Peter writes this uh, you know, description. And uh, he really uh, describes it 
well as any of the Bible writers, says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. So, Peter describes this. So one of the things that, that's going to happen, and it'll be like, you know, after all the things that God needs to do on the earth with different judgments and you know, resurrection of the dead and, and all those things. Uh, last thing that He's going to do with this earth is destroy it and make a new one. Now, you know, as, as great as this earth and heaven are, we can't even imagine what the new one is going to be like. And as far as from what I understand, it will be like it, uh, like it will be when the kingdom comes in. The earth is promised to Abraham's descendants, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to their descendants, to the nation of Israel. They will have the dominion of the earth. Our place will still be, as Paul tells us, in the heavenly places. So it's going to be a whole new heavenly you know, places out there for us. What exactly we're going to do, don't know. But uh, it'll be good, whatever whatever it will be. It's one of the reasons why we're going to receive glorified bodies. We'll be able to exist in, you know, space, I guess, heaven, the heavenly places and whatever we'll do up there. Uh, but one way or another, everything in this earth, it's all going to be melted down and maybe recycled. <laughs> <laughs> Send it to the scrapyard and have it melt down and recycle. I mean, the earth is mostly iron, so I guess it wouldn't be hard to melt down. So, uh, all you know, all of the things of man are either going to crumble into dust eventually, or if they last that long, they're going to be all melted down, and you know, God's going to make a new one. And you know, of all the things, we wish we knew more about what the new heaven and new earth is going to be like. But I'm going to tell you the greatest thing and the thing that I'm looking forward to more than anything else is that it will be where righteousness will rule and reign. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, I tell you, of all the, whatever, what, what, you know, however it is, whatever God has planned in store, whatever we're going to be doing, beautiful places we may live, what, who knows? God knows, we don't. But the one thing we do know, and the best thing about it is, man, there's not going to be any more sin, no more crime, no more violence, no war, no hatred. All that stuff's going to all be gone, done away with. Man, I tell you, I look forward to that more than anything else, any, any other, you know, any other thing that we could even imagine about the new heaven and new earth and all that. So, as Jesus said, you know, the... Uh, Heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Isaiah says, the grass withers and the flower fadeth. But the, the word of our God shall stand forever. And uh, we, we know that to be true. We have testimony in that. In the fact that we still have the Bible. Right. You know, I mean, there's nothing, not one object in the history of man that has received more violence against it. I mean, entire kingdoms have tried to wipe this out. Superpowers of the earth, the Soviet Union, with all of its power, tried to wipe out the Bible. They could not do it. You know, Hitler and the Nazis and uh, whoever else, whoever else you want to name. In our world, uh, you know, there's no, uh, there, there's no love for the Bible in our common culture today. In our it's world, the complacency does more damage to the Bible than anything. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. It's uh, uh, like to who, just people taking it for granted. You know? Who was it? Somebody made that. It's a famous statement by somebody. They said that the the greatest detriment. Or something to the word of God is not the attack of its enemies, but the uh, the neglect of its friends. Exactly. You know, yeah, that's right.
And, uh, you know, if y'all heard me get on the soapbox before about times when, I don't know, in the last, I don't know, year, I guess, two or three, for whatever reason, churches we had visited. And you know how many people I saw carrying a Bible? Two. Us. <laughs> and this is, you know, one big top name, you know, church and one of them was a cowboy church, and I don't remember what the third one was. But and then a friend of ours, uh, you know, he said the same thing. They had gone to, they were somewhere on Easter Sunday, gone to visit some church somewhere. Went in there, and he said, you know, I saw one person carrying a Bible, me. <laughs> so you know, if people aren't even carrying them to church, reading them there, uh, they're not reading them anywhere else either. So anyway could really get on a soapbox about that. And that's one thing that used to really bother me. Uh, in a you know, previously unnamed church that people didn't take their Bible. Of course, you know, there's reasons why. Probably not a lot of reason to carry your Bible there because it's not a lot going to be you know, taught out of it. But anyway, I won't get on that soapbox either. Well, of course, and I think the problem we people have gone to a lack situation there more to the tune of tell me instead of show me. Yeah. Well, and it goes back to, and this is a gripe that I have had for decades, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to even start this Bible study is because nobody is teaching people the basic fundamentals of how to study the Bible on their own. Right. The thing that the one thing other than preaching the gospel and, you know, bringing people to Christ, that's number one. Number two is teaching people how to study and understand the Bible on their own. But we don't do that because it's boring mm -hmm. and it doesn't draw lots of people. It's not entertaining, you know. And so, oh, we're not going to do that because, you know, it might cut our numbers down. And, you know, so we neglect the Word of God to be popular and a you know, social club and draw the numbers because the numbers make us look good and, you know, all but so we, you know, the 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 entity on earth that is supposed to be the one to teach people how to study and understand the Bible on their own, and then you know come together and, and learn it together and grow and and so on like that is you know the one that's not doing it. so. You know, it, but I tell you what, that's why. There are growing numbers of groups like this because people, you know, they're in churches and they're not learning anything and so on. And they, they gripe to a couple of their friends and, you know, then finally somebody will say, hey, we're having a you know, Bible study at our house, you know, and why don't you come on? We, you know, we study the Bible. So they, they go and they fall in there and they start to learn. And they start, man, I never, I never heard, nobody ever told me that was in the Bible. I never saw that before. You know, wow, now that makes sense. And so, you know, that's why, uh, and then they, you know, after a while, they start a group at their house and, and so on like that. That's why. And that's uh, that's when it started in the beginning of time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's how, during Paul's day, that's how the churches were. They met in homes and they studied the word and, you know, those kind of things. Ate, you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing. So, well, but. I, uh, I think there's two things where you eat, but at the same time, what do you do? You learn. Routine. Yeah, yeah. You absorb the, the, the yeah. word of God. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, so fellowship and, uh, and coming together and studying the word. And uh, you know, uh, I, I'm sure that there's probably better ways of, of doing things than the way I do it. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm I'm thankful to have this group because I tell you what, it, it really. Helps me learn when I have to, you know, study to teach it. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah, we uh, the the church has neglected God's word. It's abandoned. It, a lot of churches have just totally abandoned. It. And I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the remedy. I don't know if there is a remedy. I, I think the die may be cast, and you know, there's no turning back. And it's just well, that's why a lot of people are doing what Paul said: come out. From, and I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, I know a lot of you still go to church over there, and that's that's fine. Uh, but, uh, 
you know, a lot of people are not, and I can understand why. And so, you know. Well, you know, a lot of the scriptures are, the Bible is on your iPad, your phone, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And a lot of people have that. That's true. Yeah, but that's true. I don't, I just can't get the connection to that little <laughs> electronic thing that I can to the yeah, yeah, yeah. word that I can see in the Bible. Yeah. Just, it's just different to me. I don't. Yeah. Well, that's me. And, and I tell you, you know, you, uh, you, you get used to where things are. In, in your Bible. So if you're looking something up, you know, I know that's over here. I know that's right in here somewhere. And you look, oh, well, there it is, you know. And yeah, and if so, you're flipping through that little page on that screen, right, it's just uh, hard just, to uh, really get a physical... Yeah, it's because uh, I've got one on my phone too. And I just, it's just not the same. No. You know, I call it a regular physical printed printed Bible in my hands. Besides that, you can't write in that. Write notes, which I haven't written. I've done pretty good. Of course, this this Bible didn't really have room. And that's one of the reasons I bought this Bible. Yeah. Now it doesn't have references in it, which I I like, but it also doesn't have room to write anything in it. And I I've got a Bible. I've got a good Ryrie Study Bible, and I've, it's one I used. 20 years ago, and I've written so much stuff in there, I hate to admit that I've kind of ruined that Bible <laughs> by writing too many notes, all in the margins and between the verses and all that stuff. So it's real distracting now. And I, especially now when I go back and I read some of that stuff, I'm like, why did I write that? Yeah. <laughs> it's in pencil, I'll try to erase it and it won't come out. So uh, anyway, but, uh, you know, the, the thing is, we... Anybody that doubts the power of God's Word, if they will just look and see that the Bible is still here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it will be here too. That, and that's, that's one of the things that really gives me a lot of confidence is that no matter what happens, mankind will, and Satan, no matter what he tries to do, he will not destroy the Bible from the face of the earth. And two... He will not be able to successfully corrupt it enough to where, you know, people won't be able to learn it and, and get the Word of God. So, it will, you know, it will stand. Well, isn't it said that the Bible is the most popular, popular book? Yeah, still the top seller, you know, in the world. Well, that's yeah, down, yeah. but the most read. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a name. Name one other book in the world that more, as many, or more people have risked their life for to protect it, to print it. I mean, think about back in the old days. You know, kind of late medieval Renaissance times in the you know. A, 14, 15, 14th, 15th century. Those guys like William Tyndall and John Knox, those guys were burned at the stake for printing Bibles, you know? Uh, and that was like in England and places like that. So, I mean, they'll burn you at the stake right then and there. I guess that's one of the positive things about <coughs> some of the social media, Facebook and so forth. You can, you know, you can voice your opinion and talk about the Bible and things like that on there. Uh, so, anyway. All right. Where are we? Okay. Here's the verse I was talking about. Jesus said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So, here is an indicator that indicates to us that even Jesus at that time was limited in what he knew. Because he's pointing out here that there are some things about prophetic events that the Father had not revealed to anybody that he alone knew. And now from what we know from our perspective, uh, the, the blanks that Paul fills in, how that, you know, the dispensation of grace was a mystery that God had kept secret from the foundation of the world. 
Well, that you know that explains to us now uh, uh, why he made those statements and how that we see in God's plan. He had some things that he hadn't told anybody about. They would be kept secret. So, knowing that, we can understand what Jesus is talking about here. And this indicates to us that there were some things that he just didn't know. Uh, which, which is okay, because that still fit in with God's plan of how it was uh, going to go. Um, this also indicates to us that the angels don't possess all knowledge, which fits in with another theory I've, I've got about the angels and so forth. Uh, it's a way off subject, so we don't need to talk about that right now. But this does indicate to us that there are things that the angels don't know. And there are other scriptures about talk about you know the, the gospel and some of the, the mysteries and things like that that the angels desire to look into and so on like that. So we have pretty good indications that the angels, which are created beings, they're not created with total knowledge. Uh, here's my we've got time. Here's my theory about the angels. The creation, the creation of the angels and a creation of man and so forth. Uh, we don't know when the angels were created. And this includes Lucifer, you know, Satan and so forth. Don't know if they were created before everything else was created or if they were created, you know, after or during the uh, time of creation. There's one school of thought that I believe has some merit, but, uh, you know, I don't know. But I believe it has some merit, and that is that they were created on day four when God created the stars, the, the, the celestial bodies, the sun, moon, and, and the stars, and things like that. That uh, it was on that day that the angels were created. Could be, we don't know. Sometime around in creation, they were, they were created at some point. Now, Adam and Eve uh, were. Uh, of course, placed in the garden, and God began to give them some things to do. He brought them the animals and said, name the animals. Now, to name the animals, they had to learn about the animals. They had to observe and things like that. He put them in the garden, told them to tend the garden. Well, not to tend the garden, they had to learn about the garden. So, my premise is that Adam and Eve were in school. When God put them in the garden, that was their school, to learn about the things they would need to know to be able to fulfill God's mandate to them to take dominion of the earth. You know, when he, he told them, this is my plan for you. I'm going to use you to, to take dominion of the earth and be my representative on the earth. Well, they didn't automatically know how to do that. They had to be educated. And it also says that God walked with them in the cool of the day every day and, and talked with them. Well, if God is talking to you, guess what? You're going to learn something. So it was God was teaching them. So they had an education uh, coming. Now, we know the angels don't know everything. So if Adam and Eve, who were created beings, had a, a process of education to prepare them for their ultimate task, the angels probably did too have some plan of education to educate them to be able to fulfill their ultimate purpose in God's overall kingdom. Did you know that there's only one being mentioned in the Bible? Uh, you'll probably, you'll probably remember I've talked about this before, I think. Only one being that states in the Bible that was created fully mature and with perfect wisdom. That was Satan, Lucifer. It says over there in, uh, I think it's uh, Ezekiel 28, that are perfect in beauty and wisdom and so forth like that and indicates that he was created with full knowledge and wisdom and he was created complete and needed no education. Probably Lucifer's main job, because he was like the anointed cherub that covered, he was like the top angel, was to oversee the education of all the other angels. That was probably a huge part of his job, which explains how he had so much influence over the angels that he could deceive one-third of them to follow him in his rebellion against God. He was their main teacher. 
And he, what he began to teach them was wrong. And he deceived them. He did the same thing with them that he did with everybody else. He, he gave them a, a counterfeit, a substitute, and subtly deceived them away. Uh, you know, because they trusted him. He was their teacher. So, anyway, that's kind of my theory. And hey, we could go on about that. It's, I believe that, you know, the tree of knowledge uh, that Adam and Eve weren't supposed to eat, it was put there for them, but not at that time. That once they had reached a certain point in their education, in their maturity, then they would have probably been allowed to eat that and, you know, it would have been a necessary thing they would have needed then for the next step in their education, but just not at, at that time. But anyway, let's get way off subject. So, indicates here there were certain things at that time that Jesus didn't know, he wasn't aware of, the angels didn't either, only the Father knew. Now, this, this gets into some interesting things here. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And he describes what he's talking about. Uh, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and uh, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, some people have taken this and gone... <laughs> down a road of extreme asceticism, understanding, their thinking is that Jesus is saying that it's not, that it's bad to eat and drink and marry and giving in marriage and, and those kind of things, that you shouldn't do those things. So that's, this is where some of the extreme asceticism has, has come from out of this. Not, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not saying there's, He's not saying that there's anything wrong with eating or drinking or getting married or giving in marriage and so on like that. The point that he's making here is that it is just business as usual among people and that they're, they're unresponsive to the warnings that they've been given. Here, here's one thing. Okay, when, when Jesus mentions Noah, now he doesn't go into details about Noah because he knows that everybody he's talking to knows the whole story of Noah. In fact, they knew some things about Noah because they had other history books and so forth and handed down traditional you know, stories and so forth. They probably knew a lot of details about Noah that we don't know. But one thing everybody he was talking to knew about Noah was that for, as far as we, we know from the details we're given in Genesis, 120 years, and probably even before that, Noah warned everybody that God's judgment and wrath was coming on the world because of its wickedness and sin. And then, before that, uh, we, we don't know if Noah's father, Lamech, was a prophet or not, but indication is that he was. And then before him, down there was Enoch. Enoch was the, like the seventh son from Adam. And we have in, in Jude's book there, he quotes Enoch's prophecy where Enoch said, Behold, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on the ungodly. That was Enoch's <laughs> message of warning that he preached. And all those other successors in that line from Adam and Seth all the way through, those that are mentioned in that line, they were all prophets. They all inherited that line. And it continued all the way down, right through Noah to Shem and so forth. So from Noah all the way back, all of those guys were warning people that judgment was coming. And then as Noah began to build the ark, and he, he told everybody, said, look, this is what God said. This is what we're doing. This is why... Judgment is coming. You better repent or the wrath of God is going to come in a flood and so forth. Well, everybody ignored it. They were totally unresponsive to the warning that they were given. That's the main point Jesus is making here when He's talking about it. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. The people are going to know 
of the warnings of coming judgment, and they're going to see the signs of coming judgment and prophecy being fulfilled, yet they're going to ignore it and just go right on like nothing's changed, nothing's out of the ordinary, judgment's not coming, everything's going to go on just like it always has, and ignore it and go on. That's, that's the main point he's making here. Now, there's another thing. Uh, this also indicates to us that Jesus believed the biblical account of Noah and the flood, the worldwide flood. So whenever all of the you know big egghead scholars and secular theologians and all of them, they, they want to say, oh, it's all myth, and they, they adapted that from the Babylonian myth, the flood myths, and all this kind of stuff, and they say that, you know, is not true, and it didn't happen, and blah, 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 blah. Well, then they might as well just uh, throw their Bible out because Jesus believed it. So, you know, if it's good enough for Jesus, I, I'm not going to doubt it. I'm going to go ahead with Noah and the flood because Jesus and the apostles, all of them, and the prophets, all of them, you know, they believed in that. So, uh, then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken and the other left. Now, if you're like me, you know, we always heard this applied to the rapture. This is talking about the rapture. But here again, when you go back and you begin to read the Bible, you say, wait a minute, that's not talking about the rapture. We know that because uh, Jesus just said, knew not till the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, where did it take them? Who was taken away? Was it the good? No, the good people were in the ark and they got saved. Everybody else was swept away in the flood because they were unrighteous. So that's what he's talking about here. Then he says, did two be in the field? One's taken and the other left, and, and this one's taken and the other left. Well, the ones that are taken away are taken away to judgment. They're swept away because they're unbelievers. They're unrighteous and they're unfit to enter into the kingdom that is coming. These ones that are left there, they're believers and they're judged righteous and worthy to enter into the kingdom of heaven on earth. So that's that's what that means. It doesn't have anything to do with the rapture. This is, you know, taken away. You don't want to be one of these that's taken away. Which it's, you know, really now, uh, Jesus had already talked about that very thing. He explained it back in Matthew 13. He says, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath the ears to hear, let him hear. And as we know that the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, uh, these things are pertaining to that promised kingdom to Israel on the earth. So that's you know that's what he's talking about. And he goes on uh, with another parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea, and gathered of every kind, which when it was full they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So that's you know what he's talking about there with those two. That, you know, one's taken and one's left, and so forth. And he says, "Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come." This is one of the reasons why. Uh, the uh, apostles, Peter and James and John and, and those guys. This is one of the reasons why they stayed in Jerusalem after his resurrection. Because they were, they were doing this. They were watching for his return because they expected him to come at any time. Until either they were killed or they were driven out or uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. They... You know, they stayed there and they were watching. He goes on to say this, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. This is why those guys stayed in Jerusalem. Because they were, they were obeying this warning that Jesus had given them. 
telling them, be ready and be watching because you don't know what hour I'm coming back. And uh, they, you know, they were there doing what they were supposed to do, taking care of his little flock, that group of the, the believing remnant of Israel that were, you know, in Jerusalem and in Judea, parts of Judea and Samaria. They were taking care of them. They were there doing what Jesus told them to do. And watching because they fully expected him to come within their lifetimes. He goes on to say, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. And don't forget, Jesus had already told the twelve that they would sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So they knew that there was a place they, they had already been uh, uh, con you know, considered faithful and wise servants and uh, had places already given to them in the kingdom. So they were <laughs> there. They were going to watch. They were waiting for his coming, you know. Go ahead. You're talking about the 12 disciples. Yeah. Wouldn't they come from the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, <clears throat> here's, and this has kind of been a, been a question uh, about the 12 disciples. And the question has been, okay, did, did those 12 disciples, did each one of them, were each one of them from one of the tribes of Israel? There's no way to know. The Bible doesn't say they may have been, but we don't know. Uh, you would think that normally the judges of the tribes would have been uh, the patriarchs of the tribes. It would have been from the tribes. Normally, that would have been the case. Uh, now, unless those 12 disciples were each one from a different tribe... Uh, you know, that would fit in. The indication we have is that they were not. They Because some of them were related, like Peter and Andrew were brothers. Uh, Nathaniel and uh, Philip, right? Philip and I think Nathaniel and Philip were brothers, I think. And possibly Matthew and Thomas may have been brothers. So a number of the disciples... Were, were related to each other. And it's likely, I believe, that James and John, well, James and John were brothers, the sons of Zebedee. I believe that James and John were Jesus' cousins. Uh, so, you know, they, that, that kind of eliminates the theory that all of them were from, from different tribes. Uh, so, the fact that Jesus called his 12 disciples and then he personally appointed them as sitting as judges over the over the twelve tribes. That would take precedence over the customary norm of having a patriarch of, as a judge over the tribes. So, so would the twelfth one be since Judas betrayed? Matthias. Yeah, it'd be Matthias, the one that in Acts chapter one, I think Acts chapter one. Where they uh, uh, appointed Matthias as uh, as Judas' successor, because Matthias was one of the ones that was you know with them from the beginning. They uh, he was a disciple of Jesus. That, you know he wasn't one of the twelve, but he was a disciple all the way from the beginning. Went through all of that with them. Even was a was a witness to his resurrection and so forth like that. Which was one of the things that you had to be to to be one of the twelve disciples. You know and there was a uh, uh, who was the other one? Uh, anyway, Matthias and boy, I can't remember the other one's name. And Matthias, you know, they cast lots, and Matthias was, was uh, chosen. So anyway, that's that. It was Matthias, and that fulfilled the you know filled back out the twelfth, the twelfth, the twelfth disciple. And so anyway, you know, it was Jesus' choice to make them appoint them as heads of the tribes when the kingdom comes in. That'll be, you know, the kingdom on earth. So, but that's why they stayed in Jerusalem and that's what they were looking for. Uh, and then here's a, a warning. He says, 
But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, here's here's something we've talked about this a little bit before. Uh, and real real quickly, we'll just kind of look at a reminder about their perspective or their viewpoint of not having a place in the kingdom. And there will be some Israelites that that are that will not be found worthy when Jesus returns to establish his kingdom and he has those judgments that are going to take place at the end of the tribulation, you know, when he judges the nations and the sheep and the goats and, and all that. Uh, and, and all of those that are alive from Israel, they're going to, you know, uh, be judged worthy or not to enter into the kingdom. Some will be found worthy. They'll be, you know, they'll hear that enter into the joy of your Lord and so forth like that. Enter into the kingdom. Others will not. They will be cast out of the kingdom. And when it says they'll be appointed their portion with the hypocrites and they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, it's because this, this doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be cast into hell, but they're going to be cast out beyond the borders of the land. They're going to be out there where the, where the Gentiles are, the remaining Gentile nations. And they won't be allowed to then come in and take part with their ancestral uh, tribes and people in the land promised to the descendants of Abraham because they didn't do the things that would have made them eligible to enter into the kingdom. Now, for these specifically people that Jesus was talking about, there were two things. Receive John's baptism and uh, receive the Holy Spirit, you know, when it, when it came. Those were the two things they had to do that, to make them qualified to enter into the kingdom. Uh, that's why they, John and Jesus both uh, you know, berated the Pharisees for rejecting that. It was the whole core of the whole conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus there in John chapter 3. We we'll probably ought to go back through that sometime. Pretty interesting. But anyway, there, point being, there will be some and they're not going to be judged worthy to enter the kingdom and they'll be cast out of the kingdom. They'll have to live out with the Gentiles and so forth. And as far as they're concerned, that's the worst possible thing that could possibly happen. And that's why they'd be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, so that's kind of like losing your salvation or turning from your salvation. Well, yeah. If you're not looking, the, looking for the day of the Lord and you're going about your business. And, yeah. But aren't the Gentiles grafted into the salvation? Well, uh, okay. In... In this, what we're what we're looking at here, this was still God's dealing with Israel under the law and the covenants. Now, back back under those, like we think of Old Testament times, if a Gentile wanted to be uh, considered a righteous Gentile, there were basically two things they had to do. Number one, they had to come in under the covenants. They had to willingly come in under the covenants. But they had to they had to put away their pagan gods, and they had to acknowledge the God of Israel as the one true and living God. You know, worship the God of Israel. They had to do it. Find that in Isaiah fifty six, verses six through eight. And the other thing they they had to do was to be be a blessing to Israel, a physical blessing. They they had to do something. To either bring offerings or uh, give something for you know like uh, the temple or a synagogue or something like that, we find examples of that in the in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the only two Gentiles that Jesus ever interacted with was the uh, the centurion in Capernaum and the uh, Syrophoenician woman in in Sidon, and both of them the they. Acknowledged Israel's God. 
as the true and living God, Israel as head of the nations, and they were a blessing to Israel. Or they acknowledged Israel as the head of the nations. So that was the, the basis of Gentile salvation uh, under the Old Testament system. That's what you know they had to do. And with Israel, they were still under the covenants that God had made with them when He said, if you listen to my voice and you keep my commandments, then I'll bless you and so forth. They were. That's what basically gave them remission of their sins and making the sacrifices and those kind of things. When Jesus came along and John and Jesus began to preach the gospel of the kingdom and they began to point out that Jesus was the Messiah, the people that heard them had to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. That basically was what they had to believe in order to, to be justified before God. They couldn't reject Jesus and be, and be justified. So, and all they had to believe about Him was that He was the Messiah because that's what had been revealed to them. They didn't know anything about His death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel that they believed was the gospel of the kingdom. That God was going to bring in His kingdom just like He promised Abraham. And that Jesus is here now and He's the Messiah who is going to bring in the kingdom. That's what they had to believe. And if they believed that, they received John's baptism and they believed that you know, they would receive the Holy Ghost and so on, and they would be worthy to enter into the kingdom when Jesus brought in the kingdom. So that's what they had to believe. Now, that changed after Stephen was stoned because, once again, the leaders of Israel had rejected, you know, they had rejected the Father way back there, they rejected the Son, and they also rejected the Holy Ghost, as uh, the Holy Spirit who's... Stephen made that statement to them. He said, why do you always resist the Holy Spirit? At that point, you know, they began to stone him to death. And uh, it's at that point that God suspended his dealings with them under the covenants and the law. And he, you know, called Paul out, revealed the mystery of the gospel of Christ to him. The gospel of Christ is pretty clear. You know, Paul states that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. He said that the Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and He rose again according to the Scriptures. That's what we believe. You know, that's what we're trusting in. And, and not only us, but Jews, anybody in the world today during this time, you know, that wants to be saved, that's what they have to trust in. Uh, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so, you know, that wasn't the gospel of them. Their gospel was the gospel of the kingdom. But we don't preach the gospel of the kingdom because, number one, we're Gentiles. The kingdom doesn't have anything to do, to do with it. That's not for us, you know. Uh, we preach the gospel of Christ. Now, in the end times, uh, they're going to, once again, they're, they're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom, but also that judgment is coming. And just like the, back in Noah's day, when they warned people that judgment was coming, that's what they're going to preach in the end times, too. And, you know, uh, anybody that uh, follows the Antichrist, they're basically going to be doomed and so forth. So anyway, I'm rambling way off, probably off subject, answering your question. But did I answer your question or go way off? So, uh, so after next week, we're going to go uh, into some of the prophetic things Paul talked about. And uh, then... We'll look at a couple of things probably in uh, books of like Peter, first and second Peter. And then pretty pretty soon we're gonna move right into the, the book of Revelation. And uh, we got some interesting things as we go into that book. And in studying that I've seen some things that I've never seen, you know, before. I understand some things a lot better than I ever did before. Uh, we're gonna talk about some stuff that I can just pretty much guarantee you, nobody in church has ever told you this before about Revelation. So if you're interested in that, if you know anybody that uh, that you think might be interested in, in hearing, you know, going through that study with us and really wants to gain a, a, you know, a new understanding of stuff in the book of Revelation, Bible prophecy, 
you know, encourage them to come because it's gonna it's gonna be some pretty good stuff. So anyway, anybody got any comments or other questions or anything? Or any of this we talk about? As I always say, if you do, don't hesitate to ask or uh, you know, and like a, I always say, uh, you in this in this group, you have the freedom to disagree. <laughs> You have the freedom to think for yourself and have your own opinion. You don't have to agree with me. In fact, if you if you don't agree with me about something, I would uh, you know I would welcome your viewpoint because you might be right and I might be wrong, and so I would welcome the correction. So anyway, all right. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for 